Well, the miners may have been all smiles since their dramatic trip back above ground, but what happens when the euphoria of being rescued wanes? Well, their mental health will have to be monitored just as closely as their physical health. With a closer look at what they and their families face, we're joined by Paula Bloom. She is a clinical psychologist. Paula, always good to have you with us to talk Thank about you. stuff like this. So Hi, first of all, let's just discuss the, uh, the celebrity side of it. You know, newfound um, fame, I suppose, is a difficult... It's so hard to know right now because you're looking at all these different psychiatric things going on. You were talking about those physical vital signs. There's a lot of emotional vital signs that we psychologists look at. We look at how people are concentrating and focusing and sleeping. The celebrity part is such a big part of all the trauma. It's hard to know because that in and of itself can be very traumatic, not just the events that happened underground. It's hard to know. Yeah. I, absolutely. Um, let's just sort of broaden it out to look at these family units mm -hmm. here because mm -hmm. obviously they were all struggling in different ways. How profound do you think that uh, the effect could be on the family dynamic now that you've had you know, one member who's been stuck for all this time underground and the others who are just in complete turmoil? Yeah, I think it's huge. Listen, all these emotional issues, trauma, depression, anxiety, any of those kinds of things have a huge impact on the things that are important in relationships, the ability to emotionally connect, the ability to communicate, and the ability to problem solve. Those are sort of the core things you need in your relationships, right? And those things are going to be incredibly affected by the symptoms related to the trauma of this event. And so, for example, let's take one of our vital signs that we look at, which is concentration. If you can't focus on what's going on, how can you listen to your spouse? right? How can you remember what people need you to do? How, if you can't emotionally connect, how are you going to pay attention to what others, you know, those very subtle cues? And then you've got, in this case, we're talking about men, so we're talking about these, these wives. You know, we women, we don't like to feel unheard to begin with. So imagine in this situation when there's a huge emotional overlay of not feeling heard, not connecting, and that experience of the minor is internal. He knows what's going on, but the people around him don't. It's like he's got his story and they are just projecting and guessing what he may or may not be feeling. And so there's going to be a lot of what, what really needs to happen is some major communication building because, again, this is really tough. Another thing, sleep. Sleep is one of these things that's affected in almost every mental health condition. Now imagine that you're having a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep. Imagine how that affects your own health and how that might affect your spouse, being able to have peaceful sleep. So I think the impact is going to be ginormous potentially. Yeah, and also, um, you know, it sort of reminds me of when you hear stories about um, near-death experiences, plane, surviving a plane crash and, and things like that, where one spouse goes through it, but the other one doesn't. And when the affected one actually comes home, there is this fundamental inability to reconnect because one's been through something so huge and the other one just, just right. can't relate. Right. And in this situation, I think that it's a little different because in some ways, both members of the, of the family have been through their own trauma. I mean, remember, it wasn't like they were just kind of off at war. Um, they themselves had no idea what was going on for those 17 days. There was so much uncertainty. So in many ways, yes, they have themselves been through some kind of trauma, near death for themselves and their family. So it's you, in, in many cases, you're going to have two trauma survivors dealing with things in the same household. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, when we saw those um, miners coming up from their time underground, um, partners, wives, girlfriends, you could see them, you know, crying these tears of joy. But when you looked at the kids also that were there waiting um, to see their dads, they were crying too. But there wasn't joy in their faces. It was like, you know, deep anguish yes. there. How will these little children ever be able to let their fathers out of their sight again? Yeah, I mean, it's just going to be a process. It's going to be a process. And, and it's the kind of thing that you have to also think about the age of the kids, because where they're at developmentally will have an impact, and what their relationships were like with their fathers before. I don't know what kind of schedules these men had before. I mean, granted, they had contact with them, but we don't know the degree to which that contact was. It was interesting, though, you brought up the tears. You know, tears of joy is really an adult idea right? Children's tears typically are not about happiness. And so it's very interesting how raw it was, especially I remember watching the differences between the sons, some of the sons' reactions and those daughters, that father-daughter thing, very profound.
Paula, I'm so glad we were able to get your contribution on this. Uh, thank thank you. you very much indeed for coming in. Clinical psychologist Paula Bloom there.